second half of may has already started now we are left barely with one month before your examination now is the time to pull up your socks now is the time to devise a strategy which is undefeatable a strategy which will help you in the examination a strategy which can in a very very short span of time can um, uh, you know make you revise the entire subject well and today the purpose of this video is to devise such a strategy so yes in this particular video we'll be discussing about two things number one the mock test paper which has been released by the institute of cost accountants of india i'm going to solve each and every question of that mock test paper in front of you so that we get a fair idea of how our examination is going to be objective number two by the end of this video i will be devising a strategy a strategy whereby we'll be figuring out that out of the 20 study notes which we have in cma intermediate direct taxation which ones will cover the maximum weightage so that our attention our focus now will be on those study notes guys now of course hard work is very much required but along with hard work we also need a fair bit of smart work these two months one month 15 days one week before the examination are the most critical period in any professional examination a student who has not studied for past six months or a year if he studies studies um, religiously if he studies um, uh, uh, through hard work and smart work and if he studies uh, really well in these two months or last one month there is a fair chance that he might pass but the student who has studied for last one year six months if he doesn't study in these two months if he uh, becomes over confident that oh i know everything i need not revise the subject as i've done fairly well in last six months he stands a chance there's a probability that he might fail so these two months the end two months and now only one month this is the deciding factor make or break the game will be decided by these these few days which are left so now my earnest request to all of you please forget about the functions which are happening at your place birthday parties friends whatsapp instagram snapchat delete all these apps from your mobile phone if you do not be in 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 social media circle of yours for next one month it is definitely not going to make a big difference but if you lose out this time the critical time before the examination and if you lose out your expensive 6 months of your life then that is going to really cost you a lot so the option is all yours the doors are open there are two doors door number 1 religiously study focus hard work on the mtps on the study material of the institute etc etc focus on all these things option number 1 door number 1 door number 2 give your 50% attention to studies and 50% attention to whatever you are doing uh, in your life um, uh, apart from studies divert your energies divert your efforts divert your mind and lose out 6 months of your career option is all yours the door is to be chosen by you and mind you our future is determined by the choices which we make today so make the right choices today and as i've already elaborated guys there are two main objectives of this video i'm going to devise a suitable strategy a ninja strategy a strategy which according to me to the best of my uh, belief will really work really well for cma intermediate direct taxation students i'll devise a strategy for all of you secondly we'll be discussing the mtp which has been released by the institute of cost accountants of india and guys what is the significance of this mtp which is open in front of you the significance is that the paper which we are going to um, uh, face in our june 2020 to examination guys that paper will almost almost be similar to the pattern which is given over here and we can expect a fair bit of resemblance in terms of scoring for example you know if salary chapter is is coming for say um uh, 20 marks in this paper we can we can safely presume that salary is one of the most important chapters which will come in your examination so we can resemble okay there is no 100% guarantee let me vouch for it 
let me give you an assurance there's no 100% guarantee that the paper will be similar to this particular paper but yes a fair bit of resemblance you will see in this paper and your paper which will come in your um, main examination that's why to analyze this paper to solve this paper religiously and to see whether we are efficiently able to um, uh, conquer the simple simple questions or the difficult questions which are there in this paper is really important because we need to know where do we stand we need to test the waters so this is a fair chance to test our waters and to test where do we stand after discussing the mtp entirely i'll be discussing a ninja strategy i'll be dis uh, discussing a, a a method a way in which we can study smart indirect taxation i know direct taxation is a very very lengthy subject as far as group 1 is concerned direct taxation is the only subject which will bother you uh, which is actually haunting you i know that so i'll be uh, devising a strategy whereby i'll be telling you what are the steps that you are going to take in next one month to ensure that you conquer this this um, monster subject this um, uh, big subject called direct taxation this video is specifically for cma intermediate i'll definitely be coming up with the video for cma final students as well in in a short span of time as of now let's discuss the model test paper which has been released by the institute of cost accountants of india all right so the model test paper has been divided into four parts which is the usual uh, paper pattern part a part b part a will contain mcqs part b will contain in objective type questions like uh, you know fill in the blanks or one line answer two line answer some small short short questions will be there in part b so part a and part b will largely be um, small questions uh, uh, multiple small questions part c will have the lengthy questions uh, there will be a choice which is given in part c and finally part d will have a one lengthy question and guys in the examination um, as well as in the mtp in the examination of the last term and in the in this mtp the question has come from salary so uh, uh, we can we can think that yes in the examination salary question will come in section d which is the um, lengthy case study based question so this is a paper pattern which is uh, to be followed in your examination which has been followed in past and it will be repeated in the coming examination as well so let's start question number 1 question number 1 has um, uh, mcqs we need to choose the correct answer so there will be 20 mcqs of one mark each guys as you um, you know scroll through the uh, paper, paper in the examination as well please start uh, ticking the right option there's no negative marking okay so please uh, start ticking whatever you feel is right you know leaving a question blank is the worst thing that you can do to yourself okay so let's start question number 1a as per section 61a 61a is the basic rule of residential status income tax act 1961 if an individual stays in india for at least so many days in a previous year he is a resident of india of the said previous year we are talking about the basic rule and yes the correct answer is 182 basic rule of residential status if you stay in india for more than 182 days then you are a resident of india then the second basic rule which is not asked in this question section 61c okay Sec section 61a the first basic rule section 61c the second basic rule so where is section 61b section 61b has been omitted there is no section 61b 61a and 61c are the twin conditions for residential status okay sir got it so the correct answer is 182 if you stay in india for at least 182 days in the previous year then you will be called as a resident um, uh, under section 61a 1b as per section 80b5 of the income tax act how many heads of income are aggregated to compute the gross total income guys there are only five heads of income so when there are only five heads of income then naturally all those five heads will be clubbed together to form the gti so the correct answer is 5 gti is um, uh, formed by aggregating the five uh, heads which are there what are the five heads salary house property uh, pgbp capital gain and income from other sources okay sir got it part c part c an ssc is engaged in business of growing and manufacturing t in india and ssc is uh, in the business of growing and manufacturing t in india the portion taxable as business income shall be what is the por portion which is taxable as business income for a person who's growing t in india so a person who's engaged in growing and manufacturing t in india uh, what proportion of business income will be taxable the correct answer is 40% second part is the correct answer so yes we have seen section 33 ab of the pgbp um uh, 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 chapter guys over there we have started this particular limit okay sir got it next d it says income up to dash is exempt in respect of each minor child whose income is clubbed under section 641a the one and only exemption which is there in case of clubbing in um, uh, case of minor children 
आंसर इज फर्स्ट फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड रुपीज फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड रुपीज पर चाइल्ड इज द करेक्ट आंसर फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड रुपीज पर चाइल्ड इज द करेक्ट आंसर एक्जेम्शन इज ग्रांटेड पर चाइल्ड टू द एक्सटेंट ऑफ फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड रुपीज E remuneration to a director who is an employee of the company. All right, now the condition is that director who is an employee of the company, which means employer employee relationship do exist between the director and the company from his company will be treated as and guys as uh, we have studied in our salary chapter as well. In case there is employer employee relationship, then that particular income will be taxable as salary. So the income will be taxable as salary. so part number uh, uh, 1e the answer is salary the reason is very clear since employer employee relationship exists therefore the remuneration is taxable as salary if this um, uh, relationship would not have been there then the income would have been taxable as say income from other sources next max amount of deduction under section 24b of income tax act for repairs of self occupied house property is all right um, now guys please tell me what is section 24b of the house property guys section 24b is interest on loan is interest on loan so when interest on loan is taken for repair of a self occupied house property what is the monetary limit of that particular deduction yes there is an upper monetary limit for this particular deduction wherever loan is taken for repair and maintenance so section 24b talks about the loan which is taken for repair and maintenance interest on that particular loan is allowed as a deduction to a particular extent what is that extent the extent is 30000 rupees per annum so interest on loan which is taken for house property for repairing that particular house property is limited to the extent of 30000 rupees you cannot have a deduction of more than 30000 rupees so what if our interest on that loan is more than 40 more than 30000 rupees guys the upper limit of the deduction will be 30 Thousand rupees, you will not get a reduction for more than thirty thousand rupees because the section in itself says that the upper limit of the reduction is thirty thousand rupees. Okay, got it. Next, what is the rate of depreciation under section thirty-two of the Income Tax Act on intangible assets? So we are talking about intangible assets. Um, uh, section thirty-two, what is the depreciation rate which is eligible on intangible assets? The correct answer is twenty-five percent. Yes, goodwill is not included in this intangible assets, and there is a separate uh, regime for depreciation of goodwill. Will. so intangible assets other than goodwill will be uh, depreciated at the rate of 25% so the answer is 25% next which of the following is not considered as transfer of capital asset under the income tax act 1961 so guys the definition of transfer very very important definition of transfer then another definition 214 of capital asset in the capital gains chapter very very important two definitions that you definitely need to learn by heart i mean um, there is no way that you can leave these two definitions in your um, uh, preparation two definitions which are there in capital gains a uh, the definition of capital asset second the definition of transfer you should be by heart you should be uh, very very uh, abridged with it all right so transfer what is not a transfer now please note that you know sometimes question specifies not but you forget to um, uh, mention this not or uh, you know absorb this not you will say that which of the following is considered as transfer okay please note about note this these things very very carefully which is not considered as transfer all right sale exchange relinquishment of course it is considered as transfer this is the first limb of definition of transfer it is definitely considered as transfer extinguishment of right definitely considered as transfer it is the first limb which is considered as transfer compulsory acquisition of land under law specific inclusion in transfer definition so what is the correct answer correct answer is fourth none of the above so um uh, uh, the all the three definition all the three um, options which are mentioned over here are covered under the uh, definition of transfer the correct answer is none of the above that is the correct answer all right family pension is taxable under the head family pension is taxable under which head now please don't get confused by this word pension once you uh, read this word then your your mind will say sir pension means retirement benefit retirement mean benefit means salary so yes family pension is definitely taxable in the hands of uh, the family members of the employee and the taxability arises under income from other sources the reason is very clear guys that the family members of the employee are not having any employer employee relationship with the company the company had relationship of employer employee with the employee now when employee is deceased um uh, uh, and the 
pension is being taken by family member of the employee or legal heir of the employee uh, under that circumstance definitely the income will not be taxable as salary it will be taxable as income from other sources the salary will be taxable as income from other sources that is the correct answer okay so next one is there is a situation of clubbing of income and a very very um, interesting case j mr x gifted a property to his son's wife okay mr j gifted property to son's wife which means mr j is the father in law of um uh, the person the son's wife and father in law gifts the uh, property to daughter in law who sold such property later so daughter in law sold the property later on the profit arising from this sale is taxable in the hands of so who shall be liable to tax um, uh, on the income which is arising from this particular sale will it be the daughter will it be the daughter in law who uh, in whose name the property was transferred or will it be the um, uh, father in law or will it be the son so there are three options right so out of those three options what is the correct option that is that is what we need to understand um, will the property be taxable in hands of mr x the income from sale of property mr x is the original transferer son's wife is the transferee son's wife is the transferee third option is the son who should be eligible to pay taxes now guys the law is very clear that when a property is gifted from a person to his daughter in law to his daughter in law then the taxability arises in hands of that particular person itself so the correct answer is second mr x mr x will be liable to pay taxes on the income which is generated um, uh, from sale of this particular property mr x the income will be clubbed in hands of mr x when he transfers the property to um, uh, a son's wife now guys this situation will be covered under um, uh, uh, under the situation where you are transferring the asset to your spouse or spouse of your son for inadequate consideration or nil consideration this situation will be clubbed under that particular uh, aspect so you are transferring your property gifting your property to daughter in law right your property uh, the income which arises from sale of that property will be taxable in hands of mr x itself it will be clubbed with mr x's income that is the law next k carry forward and set off of accumulated loss so we are carrying forward and set off accumulated loss and depreciation depreciation in case of d merger we are carrying forward and set off uh, uh, making set off of accumulated loss and unabsorbed depreciation in case of d merger is dealt with under section dash of the income tax act so they are uh, asking you the specific section in which this particular situation is dealt with guys the section is 72a4 although i always tell you that you know it's not mandatory to uh, learn the sections subsections um, uh, at intermediate level i always tell you that i agree i abide by my statement even now then sir what is this guys there is a fair chance that you know one marks two marks question can come like this where you will be asked a particular section now you know for for attempting a, a very pra pragmatic view i am giving you for attempting that two marks or three marks question if uh, i i tell you to learn all the sections of the income tax act that will be unfair to you because your time will be wasted in learning all the sections so yes some major sections you should already remember because you revise so many times so for example 32 is for depreciation this you should remember right 15 is the charging section for salary this you should remember okay so certain sections they should uh, be on your tips but it is not mandatory to learn all the sections however over here i am giving you an answer that uh, you know um, this particular part is dealt with in section 72 a 4 all right next medical insurance premium is deductible under section dash of the income tax act where is medical insurance premium deducted answer is 80 capital d now guys at least i can expect that you know deductions chapter and that two main deductions the primary deductions which are there in the deductions chapter at least you should remember them okay 80c 80d 80dd 80u these are certain prime deductions which Uh, section numbers you should learn okay this you should be in your target list similarly tds sections 192 194 193 194 um, a all these tds sections they should be on your tips okay so these are certain sections which even i recommend you to remember okay this is one of those sections so answer is 80 d for medical insurance premium all right m under section 
TTB of the Income Tax Act. All right, in uh, um, the section is TTB of the Income Tax Act. Okay. So under section TTB of the Income Tax Act 1961, a senior citizen can claim a deduction up to dash dash in respect of income from interest on deposits. So guys, the question is for interest on deposits. A senior citizen can claim um, uh, the deduction. So suppose the question was not of a senior citizen but of a normal citizen, then the answer would have been ten thousand rupees. But since the question asks about senior citizen, the answer will be sec. Uh, the answer will be third, which is fifty thousand rupees. The answer is third, which is fifty thousand rupees. The correct answer is. That the reduction is allowed to the extent of fifty thousand rupees. Then N payment of interest on loan for higher education is deducted under section. So I've already made you uh, remember this section, guys. A T E E is for education. So if uh, loan is taken and interest on loan is allowed as a deduction um, for higher education, then the section which is um, dealing with this particular part is A T capital E. And let me reiterate, guys. Section 80 uh, uh, deductions and TDS deductions. Those sections you have to remember. You have to remember. There's no, um, uh, you know, compromise with that respect. Now, uh, what I have done in my book. In my book, you can see after every chapter, there's a summary of all the uh, sections, right? Especially in deductions chapter and TDS uh, uh, chapters, I have made a very concise summary of all the sections. So please go through that entire summary. Just read them thrice, and you will be able to uh, remember all the sections quite well of deductions as well as TDS. So you will face no problem. All right, sir. Next one is O oh, T uh, the rate of TCS in case of alcoholic liquor for human consumption is. So what is the rate of TCS for alcoholic um, liquor? The answer is third one percent. So yes, again a, a section which um, requires a fair bit of remembrance. No, I'm not asking you to remember each and every section of um, uh, you know the entire act. But yes, TDS, TD, TCS, TDS, and deductions. These are three uh, prime chapters where sections are required to be remembered. And guys, you will not face any problem in uh, remembering the sections because the sections when you revise again and again, they are automatically remembered. They are um, uh, you know they uh, come into your ecosystem automatically. automatically assessor needs to pay advance tax in previous year if its advance tax liability is 10000 rupees if your advance tax liability is more than 10000 then you are required to pay advance tax in the previous year q the time limit for submitting belated return oh yes recent amendment guys recent amendment since there is a recent amendment wherever there is a recent amendment you will definitely um, uh, stand a higher chance of that particular section coming in the examination because of the recent amendment so recent amendment has come in this particular section belated return under section 1394 of the income tax act um, uh, uh, so income tax act Uh, has the provisions of belated return what do you mean by belated return if your return is not um, uh, filed within the normal time which is given in 1391 then you file return uh, delayed little bit delayed under section 1394 that is the concept of belated return and the answer is 31st december of the relevant assessment year 3 months before the end of the relevant assessment year that is the timeline which converts into 31st december of the relevant assessment year so uh, belated return is to be filed within this timeline an individual needs to pay 1 lakh as advance tax during the financial year by 15th of june the first installment of advance tax guys how much amount of advance tax should he pay guys the first installment is 15% of the advance tax liability so on 15th of june he should pay 15000 rupees as his tax liability what is the taxability of employers contribution to unrecognized provident fund ah now this is a very very um a crucial thing and guys if you have not uh, yet seen my marathon videos of salary chapter where i have discussed the contribution which is made to provident fund in great detail and trust me the fundamental which i have clarified in this particular uh, video uh, which is which is which i'll try to put in i button as well the fundamental which i have described over here you will not forget what is the taxability of employers contribution in your entire life and i can vouch for it the concept which i have given you in uh, contribution to provident fund that concept will make you remember the concept for your entire life so 
taxability of employers contribution to unrecognized provident fund and i've told you unrecognized provident fund is not approved so it's hardly any fund okay it's hardly any fund it's hardly any uh, investment so to say it's just like the employer uh, keeping his money in some uh, other bank account and saying that it's employees um, fund but actually employer um, uh, you know might do some um, hey thing with that fund so that is an unrecognized fund uh, 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 unapproved fund so it is almost equivalent to employee giving nothing to the employer employer giving nothing to the employee it is all almost equal to employer keeping the money to himself okay employer is not distributing this money as um, uh, income of the employee it is almost equivalent to that this is the way i have made you remember this these sections okay so this particular um, uh, um, uh, um, contribution will be exempt from tax so no tax is levied on employer's contribution to provid unrecognized provident fund because we consider that this is not salary at all of the employee because uh, unrecognized means unapproved and employer is free to do whatever he can do from this fund okay so it is hardly any salary it's not salary at all yes but when, whenever it is received by the employee at that point in time we will tax this particular amount okay sir got it next t under section 16 2 of the income tax act entertainment allowance is deductible up to so what is the upper limit of deduction of entertainment allowance guys uh, please remember entertainment allowance is first added fully taxable as an allowance in the salary section and then it is allowed as a deduction subject to maximum of 5000 rupees so the ultimate amount um, uh, the the upper limit which up to which the entertainment allowance is allowed as a deduction under section 16 2 is 5000 rupees so 5000 rupees is the correct answer all right sir so this was question number 1 pretty straightforward and pretty simple okay i must say this is pretty straightforward and pretty simple there was nothing too complicated about this particular um, uh, question guys because this question was um, uh, based, dealing with the basic sections your basic knowledge okay now 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 the key point is you have 180 minutes to solve this entire paper okay let me bring my calculator and i'll show you an interesting calculation which you should follow in your examination also okay so you have 180 minutes to solve your entire paper 180 i'm dividing by 100 100 marks so one mark carry 1.8 minutes now the ask is the mood point of consideration over here is you get 1.8 minutes for solving one mark question Although we have not taken more than 30 seconds to solve any of the question which was given in question number one, although we have not taken more than 30 seconds or 20 seconds to solve all the question and that should be the case. But in any case guys, if you get stuck in some of the question and you're feeling that your time is getting wasted, you cannot afford to spend more than two minutes in a one mark question. Leave that question there and then immediately. You cannot think about that question for more than two minutes. Of course, I will try to wrap up each of the question within 30 seconds. Maximum 40 seconds, I will try to wrap up each of the question. I will try to do that. But still, if I get stuck on some question of which of um, uh, illustration number one, um, question number one, if I get stru stuck on some of the um, point, I will in no case um, exceed two minutes per question. Two minutes is the upper time limit that I can afford. So 1.8 minutes uh, per mark. Okay. Now we start with question number two and question number two, 10 questions are there for two marks. So 1.8 multiplied by two, I have 3.6 minutes, 3.6 minutes to solve each of the question. I will in no case exceed 3.6 minutes per question, but yes, I will try to save upon time and I will try to solve the questions and write uh, or type because this will be typing oriented. I'll try to type um, for at least one, one and a half minutes on each of the questions. And guys, please don't be very, very precise with your answers. Although it's written that you are required to, uh, each question carry two marks, each question is followed by a space where you are required to type your answer. Although the, um, uh, the, the, the expectation might be that you write brief answers, but guys, um, at the cost of your marks, you cannot be brief. Okay. So please write at least that much which is required. Don't write one word answers. Okay. Some students will write one word answer. One word answers are especially not ex accepted in this particular section number two. <clears throat> Typically. You should always start your answer by giving a section reference. So as per the relevant provisions of section so and so. Suppose if you do not remember the section, then you should write as per the relevant sections of the Income Tax Act 1961. This should be a common um, uh, paraphrasing technique which you should follow in each of the answers. This should be there and do not write one word answers. Okay, in these do not write one word answers because they expect you to give uh, answers um, uh, for two marks. Okay, so question number one. 
Mr. M is an Indian citizen. So Mr. M is an Indian citizen who leaves India for the first time during the previous year for the purpose of employment after staying 80 days. So for 80 days he was in India. So for 80 days Mr. M was in India and for rest of the days so out of 365 days 80 days he was in India for rest of the, of the days he was not in India what will be his residential status so guys you need to analyze the residential status in case of Mr. M and Mr. M um, uh, was uh, not in India for more than 182 days so the first and basic rule which is section 61A Section 61A, the first and basic rule is not uh, fulfilled in this particular scenario. So, um, uh, as per Section 61A, Mr. Uh, M is not a resident of the country. But yes, let's move on to Section 61C. According to Section 61C, whether Mr. Um, uh, A will be uh, a resident or not, that is what we need to dwell now. Now, it says that, you know, for the, for the period, for the current year, Mr. A was there for 80 days, right? Now, Yes, section 61C, the second base rule that will ask you to stay in India for more than 60 days. Was Mr. M in India for more than 60 days? Answer is yes, he was very much in India for more than 60 days. Now, if he was in India for more than 60 days, we have to uh, fulfill one more condition that in past four years, he should be in India for more than 365 days. Now, we need to analyze whether in past four years, was he in India for more than 365 days? Answer is yes, because he went outside India for the first time during the previous year. Now, one very important thing which is to be analyzed over here is that he went outside for employment. He went outside for employment. And if he went outside for employment, then we are not required to see the second condition, which is 6-1-C condition. You are not required to see that condition. So, Although we have analyzed 60 days and 365 days condition, but we'll ignore it completely. And we'll uh, base our answer only on the first condition, which is 61A condition. And I've already told you, 61B section is extinguished, it's omitted. So according to section 61A, we'll be framing our answer, and our answer will be that Mr. M will be a non-resident as per section 61A. Please write down, write down the answer. I'll dictate a, a, a small line uh, for you so that you are able to understand what is the length of the answer which is expected out of these particular questions. Please write, as per the provisions of section 61A, as per the provisions of section 61A, Mr. M is a non-resident. Mr. M is a non-resident comma since he was in India for less than 182 days full stop for less than 182 days full stop further further the provisions of section 61C, the provisions of section 61C will not be applicable on Mr. M, will not be applicable on Mr. M because he is an Indian citizen, because he is an Indian citizen who left the country for employment purposes. He is an Indian citizen who left the country for employment purposes. <clears throat> All right, so this is the answer which is expected out of you. You've written the exceptions to section 61C. You've written why 61A is applicable um, or not applicable as the case may be. And finally, you uh, start with your answer. So the first line should be your answer that Mr. A, Mr. M is a non-resident. So first line should be your answer. That is the technique. Question number two. 2B. What is the maximum amount of standard deduction under Section 61A of the Income Tax Act 1961? Standard deduction, we are all aware, it is 50,000 rupees. But one word answer is not ex expected, okay? So let's write a line at least. As per the section, as per Section 161A of the Income Tax Act, as per Section 161A of the Income Tax Act, the maximum amount of standard deduction is allowed at rupees 50,000 is allowed at rupees 50,000 per annum full stop this is irrespective of 
the actual expenditure incurred by the employee this is irrespective of any expenditure incurred by the employee full stop but it is subject to but it is subject to the salary of the employee it is subject to the salary of the employee so yes 50000 or salary whichever is um, lower is the uh, uh, condition so these two things we have written additionally why because uh, we need to actually write down sub to two marks right next if an assessee lets out the property to his employee oh assessee is letting out the property to the employee where such letting out supports a smooth flow of the business what is the reason of letting out reason of letting out is the business income of the assessee then such rent shall be chargeable to tax specify the head under which it should be taxable guys very very clear pretty much clear it is taxable under the head pgbp and yes um, the study mat of the institute of cost accountants of india contains specific provisions specific paragraph for this particular aspect whereby it, it explains that subletting of property <coughs> to the employee or if um, you know uh, letting of property to the employee and if he sublets uh, to someone else any of these scenarios will not be categorized as income from house property so if the employee um, if you uh, sublet your pro uh, let your property to employee then you will have business income pgb taxable under pgbp and if employee sublets it to someone else then it will be taxable as income from other sources in hands of the employee both these cases have been discussed in your study material of institute of cost accountants of india in detail and now sir sir how should we present this answer please write the answer as per the relevant provisions of the act as per the relevant provisions of the act comma if an assessee if an assessee lets out the property to his employee for smooth flow of business for smooth flow of business then such rent is taxable as pgbp then such rent is taxable as pgbp okay sir got it now let's see illust uh, question number 2d what is the rate of additional depreciation on a new plant and machinery now very very important section guys additional depreciation um, which is there in your syllabus um, which is a very very important aspect of this particular act additional depreciation means whenever a new plant machinery is purchased then uh, some additional amount of depreciation is allowed as a deduction apart from the usual deduction which is there under section 32 some additional amount of depreciation is allowed what is the rate of this depreciation guys the rate is 20% okay the rate is 20% please don't get confused by the rates of 35% which is given for specified areas because that rate is outdated now now that date rate is no more relevant for your exam standpoint the only relevant uh, rate is 20% so the additional depreciation um, uh, is levied at the rate of 20% so please write down the answer as per section as per section 3212a this is yet another important section guys so you should remember it okay as per section 3212a of the income tax act the additional depreciation which is levied on new plant and machinery the additional depreciation which is levied on new plant and machinery is at the rate of 10% uh, is at the rate of 20% sorry is at the rate of 20% is at the rate of 20% full stop please continue if the new plant and machinery is used for less than 180 days if new plant and machinery is used for less than uh, 180 days less than 180 days then 10% of additional depreciation is allowed in the current year 10% of additional depreciation is allowed in the current year and the remaining 10% is allowed in the subsequent year remaining 10% is allowed in the subsequent year so yes guys although the question was not asking any of such information from me but still i have to write one more sentence apart from my original answer so at least two lines are expected out of you okay please note this fact which type of expense are covered under section 35 of the income tax act yes a very simple pretty straightforward um, uh, answer yes scientific research 
yes scientific research expenditures are covered under 35 uh, capital as well as revenue expenditures are covered under this particular section and allowability is um, uh, defined therein also donations made to certain specified associations for scientific research is also allowed in this particular section so please write as per section 35 as per section 35 of the income tax act oh please uh, convert the language okay please convert the language section 35 of the income tax act determines section 35 of the income tax act determines the allowability of scientific research expenditure <clears throat> the allowability of scientific research expenditure full stop the expenditure may be done on in house facility the expenditure may be done on in house facility or donation to a donation to a outside organization donation to a outside organization so this is the answer for this particular part and yes as usual i have extended one more line with the main answer which is uh, which is expected guys two marks question it is at least expected out of you next an equity share in a company listed in india all right so equity share which is listed in india shall be termed as short term capital asset state the maximum period of holding of such asset so uh, an equity share of a listed company an equity share of a listed company what is the time period within which this particular share will become short term and uh, after which the uh, share will become long term that is the ask okay please write the answer as per the relevant provisions of the act the period of holding the period of holding of listed equity shares listed equity shares should be at least 12 months to term it as long term capital asset to term it as long term capital asset full stop if that asset if that asset is held for less than 12 months and where you you've written that asset just put an arrow and write listed equity shares where listed equity shares is held the held for less than 12 months then it will be termed as short term capital asset then it will be termed as short term capital asset that is how we are going to answer this question okay next is g mr a received cash gift of 1 lakh from his friend mr l on 10th october 2021 all right so mr m is recipient of cash gift okay cash gift is received from a friend please note not a relative or something like that states its taxability in hands of mr a under which head of income or otherwise so you need to state whether this particular income is taxable in hands of mr a if yes then what um, uh, head should it it be taxable yes sir so please write the answer as per section 56210 as per section 56210 of the income tax act as per section 56210 of the income tax act and how do you write 56210 56210 this is how you write 56210 so as per section 56210 of the income tax act comma cash gift of 1 lakh rupees from a friend will be fully taxable in hands of mr a full stop oh before full stop in previous year in previous year 21 22 full stop shall be fully taxable in hands of mr a in the previous year 21 22 full stop this income will be taxable under the head this income will be taxable under the head 
income from other sources it will be taxable under the head income from other sources that is the correct answer okay sir got it so this was part g next is h state the income against which loss of speculative transaction or business can be set off now very very important very very peculiar um, aspect guys uh, set off of income so if you have loss from speculative transaction or speculative business what is speculative business speculative business is a business which depends on chance which depends on probability for example if you are dealing in equity shares and you do not take the delivery of the equity shares you just buy them and sell them on the same date and at the end of the day you are netting off the uh, income and expense then that is known as speculative transaction to to explain you in little detail, little little detail i want to own reliance industries limited share worth 10 lakh rupees i purchase them and keep it for longer period of time that is not speculative transaction but if i purchase 10 lakh rupees worth of shares and sell it on the same day and the differential of the price which i pay and price which i receive i settle it at the end of the day then that is a speculative transaction i don't have 10 lakh rupees still i'm investing in um 10 lakh rupees worth of share of reliance industries limited that is speculative transaction so the ask is the question is that speculative transaction loss can be adjusted against which income the answer is very clear guys uh, please refer to the uh, marathon video of um, uh, clubbing and uh, set off and carry forward over there i've explained through a table through a chart any income which is from speculative uh, loss which is there from speculative trans transaction can be set off against income from speculative transaction itself it cannot be set off against any other income it can be adjusted against only the income from speculative transaction so please write the answer as per the relevant provisions of the act as per the relevant provisions of the act loss from speculative transaction loss from speculative transaction can be set off loss from speculative transaction can be set off against income from speculative transactions against income from speculative transactions only so as per the relevant provisions of the act losses from speculative business can be set off against income from speculative business only and you can mention the section also section 73 section 73 all right so got it next is what is the due date of filing of return of income under section 131 of the income tax act in case of individual having only salary income and interest income okay two incomes are there guys the chapter is pan and return return and pan that is the chapter so uh, under this circumstance the due date of filing of return is 31st of july of that particular assessment year so please write the answer as per section 1391 of the act as per section 1391 of the act comma in case an individual has only salary income and other sources income like interest etc is required to file its return of income latest by is required to file its return of income latest by 31st july of the assessment year 31st july of the assessment year that is the answer J how is standard deduction under section 24A of the income tax act calculated now we are referring to the standard deduction of the chapter house property right house property has a standard deduction and the 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 formula is very simple guys 30% of the nav that is how standard deduction is computed so let's write as per section 24A of the income tax act comma the standard deduction from income from house property is allowed standard deduction from income from house property is allowed to the extent of 30% of nav to the extent of 30% of nav in case the nav is negative in case the nav is negative the standard deduction will be zero in case the nav is negative the standard deduction will be zero okay sir got it so yes the, this was question number 2 guys and again i am telling you 
time and again that question number one and two are really really simple they will come um, in a very very simple uh, format so first of all you should target doing question number one and two uh, primarily okay just finish them first of all do not leave any answer um, any question unanswered okay answer all the questions whether right or wrong yes you can come back on to the question number one and two back if if your paper is finished before time you will be allowed to come back so don't worry about that but don't leave any question unanswered whatever is your first thought just um, uh, plug in that particular answer in the question so that uh, you don't miss upon um, any question which is unanswered leaving question unanswered is the worst thing to do next is section c now section c has a choice you are required to answer four out of six questions you need to answer four out of six question each question will have 12 marks each question is for 12 marks um, uh, each four questions mean 48 marks and guys in this particular question there's a high probability that at least two questions come from from your study mat as it is okay so the key is do your study mat very very properly be it a theoretical part or the practical part do the entire practical part very very thoroughly do the theoretical part also thoroughly from the study mat of the institute of cost accountants of india that is the prerequisite all right so section c now of course you need to choose which question do you want to do um, i will be solving all the questions so that you don't face any con confusion in any of the question but yes you have to choose which question do you know the best okay and you are the best judge guys i cannot guide upon this fact that you know you choose this question or that question you are the best judge just read th through the question and just um, uh, think think through whether you are able to uh, comfortably answer this question or not you can also do one thing you can first read all the six questions of section number C and then start doing those questions whom in your priority list is the easy most or you think that you'll be able to uh, conquer them well. So for example, if I'm concerned, you know, I'm very comfortable with residential status. So I'll start uh, soon as I'll see residential status question, I will definitely attempt it. Even before studying or reading the next question, I will first attempt this question because I know that I'm very, very confident in residential status chapter. That is the key. So <clears throat> you should take care in choosing what is the uh, correct um, uh, way for you what is the correct option for you you need to choose over here all right let's read the question f is a foreign citizen he his presence in india in last several years is as follows so you have been given the presence in india in last several years for us the year in which we are sitting is the last year the last year is previous year 21 22 which means assessment year 22 23 and the previous year he is in india for only 86 days so the mind says that basic rule 1 6 1 a 182 days is not satisfied that is the first conclusion that i can draw even before um, uh, reading the further question right so these are certain things which should come to your mind okay the next thing which is coming to, your, to my mind without even reading the uh, questions is that what is the period of stay of last four years what is the period of stay of last four years so why is it coming in your mind because section 61 c the second base rule <laughs> <clears throat> that will ask me uh, or that will require me to uh, uh, see what is the period of stay in last four years and what is the third thing which is coming into my mind what is the period of stay in last seven years okay 729 days or more so that will come uh, into picture when i'll be uh, uh, studying through section 66 so these things should automatically come to your mind because these are obvious and the questions will also be centered over these things okay so let's read the questions find out whether mr x is a resident or non-resident under section 61a of the income tax act so first we are talking about the first base rule which is 61a so first we'll be talking about 61a is mr f satisfying the conditions given under section 66a 66a <coughs> is this the um, additional conditions for n nor and or right we'll analyze that also for the previous year 21 22 uh, question number three what will be mr f's residential status for previous year 21 22 we need to find the residential status all in all okay yes sir then that's it that's it these are the three questions and 332 is the bifurcation which is there 332 is the bifurcation which is there so guys in this particular situation <clears throat> i will quickly turn on to my register okay i will quickly turn on to my register i will open my register I will quickly write number three, okay? And I will write certain things, okay? What will I write? First of all, I'll write previous year. Then I'll write period of stay, okay? And I'll do it all rough, okay? I won't uh, do anything fair. <clears throat> but the rough, whatever I'll do, I'll do it in a neat manner, okay? So previous year, 21, 22, period of stay is 86 days, okay? Okay, last four previous years 
and last seven previous years is the data which I want from the question. Okay, and let's see what is the uh, data which is given for last four years and last seven years. So I've opened the MTP in my uh, tab as well. Okay. I need for last four years, I need for last seven years because I need to analyze the residential status. And from that only I will call out the uh, answer to the individual parts. Okay. So last four years. Okay. Let's total up last four years stay. It's 200 plus 91 plus 186 plus 99. The period of stay for last four years is 576 days, which certainly is more than 365 which is the stipulated time period perfect last seven years last seven years guys last seven years okay 200 plus 91 plus 186 plus 99 plus 278 plus 96 one two three four five six one more year 162 so last seven years stays 100 and 1112 which certainly is more than 729 days so guys, these are the two um, uh, dates which I have called out. These are the two timelines. These are the two um, uh, uh, important facts which I want to know. Actually three, not two, actually three, right? Now I'll be answering the questions. Now let's get back to the question. The first question is, find out whether Mr. X is a resident or a non-resident under section 61A, which is the first base rule. Please write the answer. As per section 61A, as per section 61A, as per section 61A, Mr. A, Mr. X, sorry, Mr. X should be in India, Mr. X should be in India for at least 182 days in the previous year. For at least 182 days in the previous year. Should be in India for at least 182 days in the previous year full stop in the current situation Mr. X is in India for only 86 days therefore he does not satisfy the condition of residency as per section 61A therefore he is a non-resident as per section 61A as per section 61A. Now guys, we are aware about the fact that 61A is not the concluding section and there is a supporting section which is 61C. That section is also there. So ideally question is centering its answer on 61A but definitely we should touch base upon 61C as well because uh, if we do not talk about both those, both these sections together, the answer will be slightly incomplete. Okay, So we'll talk about section 61C as well. Please write in the next line, as per section 61C <coughs> of the Income Tax Act, as per section 61C of the Income Tax Act, a person needs to be in India for 60 days <coughs> in the previous year for 60 days at least for 60 days in the previous year and for at least for 365 days in the last four previous years at least for 365 days in the last four previous years full stop in the current situation Mr. X satisfies both the conditions in the current situation Mr. X satisfies both the conditions therefore he becomes a resident Therefore, he becomes a resident of India, of India. He becomes a resident of India. Now guys, in this particular part, I am not asked whether ordinary resident or not ordinary resident. So I am not touching that particular aspect. I am not touching that part. That I will touch in section 66A, okay. 66A, I will touch that particular part. I am not touching that particular part over here, okay. Okay. Next part. Is Mr. F, oh, Mr. F or Mr. X? I think there is some uh, printing mistake. All right. So, guys, this should be also be F, okay? Because this is also F, so this, that should also be F. So, please change your X into F in the 
फर्स्ट पार्ट आंसर इज वेल इज मिस्टर एफ सेटिस्फाइंग द कंडीशन अंडर सेक्शन सिक्स सिक्स ए फॉर द प्रीवियस ईयर ट्वेंटी वन ट्वेंटी टू सो नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट सेक्शन सिक्स सिक्स ए द टू एंड ट्विन कंडीशन विच आर गिवन इन सेक्शन सिक्स सिक्स ए फॉर एनी पर्सन टू बिकम अ नॉन नॉट ऑर्डनरी रेजिडेंट द ट्विन कंडीशन आर कंडीशन नंबर वन दैट ही शुड बी अ नॉन रेजिडेंट फॉर नाइन आउट ऑफ टेन प्रीवियस ईयर्स और ही शुड बी इन लेस ही शुड बी इन इंडिया फॉर लेस दैन सेवन ट्वेंटी नाइन डेज फॉर पास्ट सेवन ईयर्स एंड गाइज एज यू कैन सी वी हैड ऑलरेडी कल्ड आउट दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन मिस्टर एफ इज इन इंडिया फॉर मोर देन सेवन ट्वेंटी नाइन डेज ही इज नॉट इन इंडिया फॉर लेस दैन सेवन ट्वेंटी नाइन डेज सेकेंडली मिस्टर एक्स मिस्टर एफ इज अ नॉन रेजिडेंट फॉर um uh, uh, not 9 years guys see this in this year he becomes a resident 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 so in last 10 years he has been a resident for more than 2 years that means for 9 years in last 10 years he has not been a non resident so both the conditions which are given under section 66a are not satisfied therefore um uh, uh, mr f is a ordinary resident so we'll write answer to this particular part part number 2 mr f is not satisfying please write the answer mr f is not satisfying the dual condition given under section 66a mr f is not satisfying the dual condition which is given under section 66a that is he is not a non resident that is he is not a non resident for 9 out of 10 previous years he is not a non resident for 9 out of 10 previous years further he is not in india or don't write not he is in india for more than 729 days in last 7 previous years he is in india for more than 729 days in last 7 previous years therefore he is not satisfying therefore he is not satisfying any of the conditions given under section 66a and the last part is what will be the residential status of mr f what uh, will you conclude on that part so the answer is very clear the residential status of mr f is that he is a resident he is a resident and an ordinary resident he is a resident and an ordinary resident that is the condition which you are going to um, uh, say and conclude in this particular part so that is your answer to question number 2 uh, 3 a so let's start the next question and the next question is 3 b mr p has purchased a gold ring as on 17th august 2020 for rupees 20000 so gold ring was purchased for 20000 rupees on 1st april 2021 which is Financial year twenty one twenty two. He has swung a diamond on it, costing twenty four twenty five thousand. Okay, diamond has been put on it uh, on first May two thousand twenty one. On first August twenty twenty one, he sold such ring for eighty thousand and incurred brokerage for arranging customer at the rate of five thousand. Compute the capital gain, if any, for Mister P for assessment year twenty two twenty three. Right now, first of all, we need to ascertain whether this. Um, Transaction is a long-term capital gain or a short-term capital gain? Yes, guys, it falls under the third category, the residuary category. So yes, this capital gain is a short-term capital gain. So if I just, you know, you don't have to write the entire um, uh, uh, terminology and the entire format. You don't have to do that on on the rough sheet which you'll get in the examination. You just will write some um, uh, cryptic abbreviations like full value of consideration. What is the full value of consideration? Full value of consideration is eighty thousand rupees. Then a brokerage has been incurred. Brokerage of five thousand has been incurred. So seventy-five thousand is the net fair value, uh, uh, full value of consideration. Then we are going to reduce the cost of acquisition. Of course, not indexation uh, is not required. Cost of acquisition is twenty thousand. Then cost of improvement is going to be reduced from this amount. Cost of improvement is. Twenty-five thousand, and the net short-term capital gain is computed as seventy-five thousand minus twenty thousand minus twenty-five thousand, forty thousand comes out to thirty thousand rupees. So short-term capital gain, which is there in this particular case, is thirty thousand rupees. Now, you know how many seconds did I uh, require to solve this question? Not many, right? But the catch is that, guys, over here, 
I have limited uh, space to write something over here. But guys, over here, you are not going to write the exact or the directly the answer. Thirty thousand rupees. No, you have to mention some words. Okay. So, for example, you have to mention F V O C is equal to so and so so and so amount. Then you have to write. Uh, you have to type less. Cost of acquisition, so and so less. Cost of improvement, so and so. So you know your time in this particular question is not going in your computation, is not going in your um, now calculation because the calculation was pretty straightforward. The time which will you will take is for putting it together on this uh, um, uh, in this particular column in this particular section. So yes, do not write the entire sentences like computation of capital gain in the hands of so and so for the assessment year so and so. Don't write those entire sentences. But yes, in a cryptic manner. You need to mention how did you arrive at the figure of thirty thousand. That's what you need to mention over here. And yes, short term capital gain you should write in uh, full. Uh, preferably start with the final answer. So start by saying short term capital gain is equal to so and so. Start with um, uh, the the final answer, and then after that uh, put the working note, working note number one, and then write F V O C less this less this less this, and uh, present your answer. It's always better to present your answer in a amicable way so that um, you know the uh, examiner is able to assess that yes you've done it correctly you've done it right and the next question is question number 4 a mr d is a non specified employee all right so uh, the category of the employee is stated that he is a non specified employee of xyz limited he is staying in a rent free accommodation provided by his employer so the rent free accommodation is provided by the employer of this particular employee which is owned by xyz limited so xyz limited is the owner of this particular rent free accommodation further he is provided with the following servants so some servants are provided to mr d sweeper appointed by mr d so appointment is done by mr b mr d that means this is in the nature of reimbursement okay this is in the nature of reimbursement guys remember there is a different treatment for reimbursement and there is a different treatment for um uh, cases where the employer is directly paying the servant there are two different tax treatments which are applicable in these two cases okay sir then maid servant salary 1000 per month watchman salary 2000 per month gardener salary 1000 per month his wife appointed a cook for salary of 3000 per month again this is in the nature of reimbursement okay this is again in the nature of reimbursement next you need to compute the value of perquisite in respect of above facility for ay 22 23 all right you need to uh, compute the value of perquisite what will be the value of perquisite so guys um, pretty straight forward when the perquisite is provided in the nature of reimbursement then the perquisite is taxable in hands of all the employees perquisite is taxable in hands of all the employees if the perquisite is provided in terms of reimbursement that is the uh, principle which we have been following so what is the total amount of perquisite in this case 500 multiplied by 12 and 3000 multiplied by 12 500 multiplied by 12 and 3000 multiplied by 12 500 multiplied by 12 plus 3000 multiplied by 12 so total amount of perquisite is 42000 rupees 42000 rupees is the total amount of perquisite which is taxable in this particular case So yes we need to really really be very cautious at this point in time because if the actual cost to the employer is taxable as per cost it um, uh, the actual cost has been incurred by the employer then it is taxable only in case of specified employees but if reimbursement of servant salary by the employer uh, it shall be taxable in hands of all the employees that is what rule 33 tells us okay sir got it so next is illustration number 4b illustration number 4 B Miss S has the following salary structure now salary structure of Miss S is given to you basic salary DNS allowance not forming part of retirement benefit this is very very critical hostel allowance does not have any child now that is also critical tiffin allowance transport allowance 200 per month bonus to 20000 per, per annum commission free refreshment in office worth rupees 5000 per annum mobile phone facility by employer 900 per month computer facility worth 10000 per annum she has been provided a rent free accommodation owned by the employer in kolkata kolkata means it's a metro state the house was allotted to her with effect from 1st may 2021 but she could occupy the same only from 1st june 2021 
guys similar question is there in our study mat as well so you know i've been telling you this thing that you know in this section you can actually expect at least two questions which are exactly driven from your study mat so doing study mat question is really essential in that respect all right now let's read the questions first okay question says uh, what is the amount of taxable allowances for assessment year 22 23 you need to compute the taxable allowances compute the taxable value of perquisites for assessment year 22 23 then compute the gross salary for assessment year 22 23 so guys what uh, what will be my strategy in this particular question i'll be computing the gross salary for assessment year 20 22 23 in the process i will be getting these two figures as well right i will not do three computations for this i will do one computation and using that one computation i'll be uh, serving the three needs which are required okay sir got it so let's start this particular illustration 4b okay so i'm just creating a you know rough structure sort of i'm not making it too formal because i know that in the examination also i'll not make it too formal but yes please remember that in the examination you will be um, uh, you know typing some part of it in your computer that is required okay sir okay let's see one by one basic salary guys you need not write all these calculations over here as, as well okay there's no need All right, dearness allowance forming part of retirement benefit. So I'll add dearness allowance, sixty thousand rupees. Uh, hostel allowance is there. Total hostel allowance and no child is there. Does not have any child, so fully taxable. Okay, twelve thousand fully taxable. Hostel allowance twelve thousand. Next is tiffin allowance again fully taxable. Tiffin allowance amount is five hundred per month. Tiffin allowance five hundred per month gives me a figure of six thousand. Then I have transport allowance two hundred per month, again a fully taxable allowance. Transport allowance which is two hundred per month, so twenty four hundred is the total amount of transport allowance. Twenty four hundred in the entire year. Then we have commission. Commission commission is fifteen thousand per annum. Then we have free refreshment in office. So free refreshment is within office. So I will not tax it. Okay, I will not tax tax any part of it. I'll assume that it's during the uh, tenure of the office, during the uh, working hours of the office. So we'll uh, keep it tax free. Mobile phone uh, will also be tax free. Computer facility will also be tax free. All these things will be. All these three things will be tax free. The only uh, perquisite which I'm going to tax is rent free accommodation. All right. Rent free accommodation is what I'm going to tax. Now, since it's a metro city, I'll tax 15% of salary. I'll tax 15% of salary. And for computing salary, I'll be making a short working note. All rough, guys. All rough. Okay. Nothing will be uh, formalized or nothing will be, um, uh, you know, uh, um, in a proper format or something like that. No need of doing all those stuff. All right. So um, I'll be adding. all the components of salary um, commission uh, dearness allowance everything i'll be adding uh, but yes dearness allowance is to be added only if it forms part of retirement benefit number 1 so in this case it will not be added so commission over here means any kind of per, uh, commission whether it's a fixed percentage of commission or not doesn't matter everything will be included in the calculation of salary which is to be computed for um, rfa purposes rent free accommodation purposes so guys there's no need to of making this um, uh, particular working note as well i'll be taking this amount this amount no this amount i'll not be taking i'll be taking this amount this amount transport allowance commission and of course if there's any uh, other amount that also will be taken okay there's one more amount guys i have bonus also which i have missed yes bonus is also there <clears throat> so i'm adding bonus as well 20000 rupees is the bonus so this is this is one thing which will also be included all right so all these things will be included okay and yes um, the salary will also be prorated for the number of months for which the house was allotted yes sir Okay, so let's add all of these. One lakh eighty thousand plus twelve thousand plus 
6000 plus 2400 plus 10,000 plus 20,000 the total is 2 lakh 35,400 okay so 15 percent of 2 lakh 35,400 multiplied by 10 divided by 12 okay 15 percent divided by 12 multiplied by 10 guys from the date when she has occupied it we'll take it from that date so this amount is arrived at 29425 29425 is the amount of rent free accommodation value all right now we'll add up all these numbers and we'll get the figure of total taxable salary there are two more parts what is the total amount of taxable allowance you will add all these parts and you will get the total amount of taxable allowance there's another part what is the value of perquisite the value of perquisite is computed like this 29425 is the value of perquisite so by doing one computation you have calculated all three parts uh, of the answers so that is how you have to really play the trick in the examination as well you don't have to start calculation calculating taxable allowances first perquisites first directly jump on to gross salary and you'll get the other two answers easily okay sir got it now next is illustration number five question number five a five a is on political party uh, registered with election commission for the year ending 31st march 22 disclose the following receipts receipts are disclosed rent of property let out to departmental store in chennai uh, interest on deposit other than bank then contribution from 100 persons of rupees 21,000 each it's more than 20,000 but fortunately all of it in all of it is in accounts paycheck plus one more thing uh, the political party has the details of each of the people as well right so um, these two conditions are satisfied so anything about 20,000 if it's uh, in account pay check and if it's um, now details are also there with the political party then it is not taxable so net profit from the cafeteria oh PGP income is there some cafeterias run um, uh, because of which the income is also there now you have to compute the total income of the political party for previous year 21 22 you need to compute the total income of this particular political party yes sir so let us add on all the numbers which are there okay please tell me one by one what are the various numbers yes all right so guys um the only income which is taxable in this particular case will be the uh, income from pgbp so rent uh, now how to present the answer how to present the answer guys rent from you will write rent from departmental store please use abbreviations wherever possible okay now you need to write section 13a okay exempt and you write a nil similarly you write interest on deposit interest on deposit you mention section 13 a and you write a nil similarly you write contribution of 100 persons okay this is what you have to type i'm telling you this is what you have to type write section 13 a write a nil and then lastly write cafeteria okay cafeteria income cafeteria profit mention the amount over here total it out to 3 lakh rupees and say that total income of political party is 3 lakh rupees this is how you need to actually present your answer so guys um, we have seen that the questions are small they require you to type therefore they are giving you ample type ample time to write also right so this is how you need to present your answer don't directly write only 3 lakh rupees okay that's not advisable write at least few lines about it if not these then abbreviate it further but abbreviation to the extent of um, at the cost of non understandability is also a problem next Hyderabad cooperative society has the following sources of income during financial year so now this is the question of cooperative society it's not a consumer crop cooperative society first you need to take care of this part all right income from processing with aid of power okay it is with aid of power it is with aid of power and not without aid of power so point to be noted income from collective disposal of labor of its members 15,000 interest from another cooperative society 25,000 chargeable income from house property 60,000 income from other business 55,000 you need to compute the profit and gains from business and profession of Hyderabad cooperative as per the provisions of income tax act for the assessment year 22 23 you need to compute the PGPP all right sir so again guys I can be a little cryptic <clears throat> I can be a little uh, you know uh, I can use certain abbreviations certain sh uh, 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 short forms um, while typing you can use them but at least give some presentation okay I'll be taking one by one all the incomes income from 
प्रोसेसिंग विद एड ऑफ पावर विद एड ऑफ पावर आई टेक इट एज एट थाउजेंड ओके देन कलेक्टिव डिस्पोजल ऑफ कलेक्टिव डिस्पोजल ऑफ लेबर ऑफ इट्स मेंबर द अमाउंट टोटल अमाउंट इज फिफ्टीन थाउजेंड येस वी आर गोइंग टू सेपरेटली मैंशन अबाउट द डिडक्शन अंडर सेक्शन एट्टी पी ऑफकोर्स इट्स नॉट टैक्सीबल इट विल बी एग्जाम इंटरेस्ट फॉर्म अंदर कॉपरेटिव सोसाइटी इंटरेस्ट फॉर्म अनदर सोसाइटी अमाउंट इज ट्वेंटी फाइव थाउजेंड रुपीज देन हाउस प्रॉपर्टी चार्जेबल हाउस प्रॉपर्टी चार्जेबल हाउस प्रॉपर्टी अमाउंट इज सिक्सटी थाउजेंड रुपीज देन वी हैव इनकम फ्रॉम अदर बिजनेसेस इनकम फ्रॉम अदर सो गाइज यू हैव टू रियली जॉट दिस डाउन क्विकली because you have to type also okay so jot it down quickly all right so this is the total we have 163000 now we are going to reduce deduction under section 80p all right so guys i am going to reduce uh, the first two as it is first of all collective disposal of labor okay this is 15000 to be reduced as it is okay then interest from another society interest from another society and i'm being very very fast and very rough because in examination you also have to be fast and rough okay don't bother about your handwriting because you need to type this in the computer so that will take time don't spend time over here spend time over there interest from other society fully exempt 25000 right and out of out of the rest of the three we'll have a cumulative deduction of 50000 rupees out of the rest three of the income we have a cumulative deduction of 50000 rupees right so what is the net taxable salary 163 minus 15000 minus 25000 minus 50000 the amount is <coughs> 73000 so the taxable income is 73000 now you've come to the conclusion you've come to the answer now you can punch it in your computer in the same format guys in the same way don't write a uh, complete uh, uh, words like deduction use d d e d e d dot don't write under section right us right so you can use a fair bit of not at the cost of misapprehension okay not at the cost of misapprehension miscomprehension people uh, will say i am not able to understand what he has written so uh, i don't want to actually uh, check his paper nothing of that sort okay now competition of gross total income of hyderabad corporate society as per the provision of that competition of pgbp profit and gains from business and profession of hyderabad corporate society as per the provisions of income tax act we have computed the pgbp we have computed the gross total income of hyderabad corporate society both we have uh, computed now based on the above facts state if any uh, deduction on gross total income and amount um, of hyderabad may claim as per the provisions of the income tax act so we have uh, computed the deduction under section 80p as well right computation of total income and tax liability of hyderabad corporate society now the last task is that we need to compute the tax computation also we need to compute the tax also okay so rest all the parts we have already uh, answered now it's the question of tax we need to uh, compute the tax also and as you are aware that for first 10000 the uh, tax will be 10% for the next 10000 it is 20% and for the balance it's 30% okay so 73000 is the total amount guys again we'll take a shortcut 73000 minus 20000 multiplied by 30% plus 3000 rupees we'll obviously take a shortcut we'll we remember this particular formula and we'll take a shortcut okay the tax which is calculated is 18900 plus we are going to add cess at the rate of 4% on this particular amount and then we are going to compute the total 
tax liability. This is how you are going to compute the total tax liability. Again, the challenge is that you know you need to mention this particular part. Type it on over here. You need to type it a fair bit of uh, with a fair bit of explanation. No, no, no need to type the entire formula or something like that. But yes, type that on first ten thousand, ten percent thousand. On next ten thousand, twenty percent, two thousand. On next thirty, thirty percent. Just write like that. You know, in a uh, brief manner. All right. Next one is. Examine and explain the tedious implication in the following cases along with the reasons thereof, assuming that deductees are resident and um, having PAN. So these all our deductees are resident and they have PAN, which they have fully, duly furnished to us. Okay. So assuming this fact, you need to compute the uh, explain the tedious implication and under which section will the tedious be applied? That is what we need to discuss in these particular parts. All right. So I'll dictate these answers to you. Please jot it down in your register so that you are able to refer to them whenever you need it. Okay. First one is Mr. M received a sum of ten lakh fifty thousand on seventeenth February two thousand twenty two. As premature withdrawal from employees provident fund scheme before continuous service of five years on account of termination of employment due to ill health. Now the relevant factor over here is ill health. Due to ill health, this is a premature withdrawal from employees provident provident fund scheme before five years continuous service. Um, before five years, you have withdrawn, and the reason is ill health. That is the Uh, a thing which is to be noted over here. All right, sir. So please write uh, as per section one ninety two capital A. The TDS is required to be deducted on this amount as per section one ninety two capital A. The TDS is required to be deducted on this amount at the rate of ten percent. At the rate of ten percent, so the rate is ten percent, and the section is one ninety two a. Next, Indian Bank sanctioned and disbursed a loan of one point one crore to Star Limited on thirty first December twenty twenty one. Star Limited paid a sum of one lakh ten thousand as service fees to Indian Bank for processing the loan application. So, for processing the loan application, the amount which is paid is um uh, one lakh ten thousand rupees now guys um as per um uh, section um uh, you know uh, uh, section two twenty eight a the definition of interest over there it is specifically written that even if when you are paying some service fee some loan service fee then it will be categorized as interest only this is a specific mention which is there in uh, the definition of interest so the tax will be deducted as per the interest rates um ten uh, percent so please write the answer as per section. One ninety four capital A. The TDS on this loan processing charge shall be deducted at the rate of ten percent. At the rate of ten percent. Full stop. As per section two bracket open twenty eight capital A bracket close. The definition of interest includes. Processing fees also. Definition of interest includes processing fees also. All right. Next one is Mr. T working in a private company is on deputation for five months from September twenty one to January twenty two at Kolkata, where he pays monthly house rent of thirty two thousand for those five months. Okay, so the uh, rent is paid for five months. Thirty-two thousand per month has been paid for five months, totaling to one lakh sixty thousand. Rent is paid by him on the first day of the relevant month. So every uh, month he pays the rent at the first day itself. Now, guys, the rent is below two lakh forty thousand per annum. The rent is below two lakh forty thousand per annum. Therefore, no TDS implication arises in this particular case. On rentals, you can you pay uh, rent only when the total rent in the year is. Two lakh forty thousand and more. So please write the answer. No TDS is required to be deducted in this case. No TDS is required to be deducted in this case since the annual payment, since the annual payment does not exceed, does not exceed rupees two lakh forty thousand. Does not exceed rupees two lakh forty thousand. The next one is. On first October twenty twenty one, Mr. H made 
सिक्स मंथ फिक्स डिपॉजिट ऑफ टेन लैख एट एट द रेट ऑफ नाइन परसेंट विद एबीसी कोऑपरेटिव बैंक द फिक्स डिपॉजिट मेच्योर्स ऑन थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू सो द मेच्योरिटी डेट इज थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च ट्वेंटी टू यू नीड टू असेस वॉट इज द टी डी एस इम्प्लीकेशन दिस पर्टिकुलर केस गाइज इंटरेस्ट इज कवर अंडर सेक्शन वन नाइन फोर ए so the TDS is required to be deducted at the rate of 10% under section 194A so please write as per the provisions of section 194A TDS is required to be deducted at the rate of 10% at the rate of 10% <coughs> from this from this income from this income All right, so yes, this was the TDS question, and yes, guys, I've already told you TDS is definitely going to be uh, an important part in this particular uh, examination. TDS questions are bound to come, so please prepare TDS questions really well. All right, now next is who can verify the return of income in the following cases? You need to write down who can verify the uh, return of income in these particular cases, which are uh, given in this particular part. So, guys, uh, I'll dictate the answer to you because. you just need not uh, write one word answer but yes um, you know one line answer will be enough individual where such individual is a lunatic individual where such individual is a lunatic which means um, he is of an unsound mind in that case who shall be um, eligible to um, file the return on this behalf so please write in case of an individual who is a lunatic comma the guardian of the individual or any person to com any person competent to act on his behalf any person competent to act on his behalf is eligible for filing the return of income for filing the return of income second is a firm for firm it's the managing partner or any adult partner okay please write in case of a firm the return can be verified by the managing partner or any adult partner any adult partner next is charitable trust so any member can um, uh, actually uh, sign the return sign the return of income or the principal officer can sign the return of income so please write in case of in case of charitable trust comma any member or the principal officer is eligible to file the return of income to file the return of income company under liquidation a company which is under liquidation so guys uh, the person who is actually liquidating the company he is responsible to sign the return of income so please write in case of a company which is under liquidation comma the liquidator of the company the liquidator of the company is eligible is eligible to verify is eligible to verify the return of income is eligible to verify the return of income okay so let's come on to question number 7a it's a question from pgbp x limited has engaged in business of manufacture of computer hardware in rajasthan since 1995 during previous year 21 22 the following assets are acquired and put to use rate of depreciation is given to you for three blocks number of assets are there in each of the block 11 12 17 depreciated value of block which is the opening wdv is given to you 18 lakh 25 lakh 5 lakhs addition of plants new plants are there during the year three new plants are there three additions are there in three blocks sale of old plants okay one plant in each block so none of the plant ceases to exist there are still uh, uh, machinery which are there in these blocks but um, you know the values are given for sale of old plants plant anc are acquired during may 2021 and not And put to use during September 2021. So put to use is uh, in September 2021, which means that more than 180 days they have been put to use. Okay, but in case of plant B, this is the one which is less than 180 days was bought in May 21, but put to use in last week of March. So it is put to use for less than 180 days. Okay, less than 180 days. So for depreciation bit, plant B is eligible for half of the depreciation. A and C are eligible for full depreciation. Relating to assessment year twenty two twenty three, calculate. You need to calculate the 
amount of additional depreciation if any first you need to calculate the additional depreciation then the normal depreciation both the depreciations are required to be calculated additional depreciation is for three marks normal depreciation is for five marks guys we'll be calculating both of them together okay we'll be calculating both of them together particulars and we'll have three columns for the three blocks guys i have this facility of making my uh, format you don't have this facility and your examination also you don't have this facility so don't even try don't even think about it okay all right that's block 1 block 2 block 3 let's see what is the depreciation bit 15 30 40 15% 30 percent, 40% that's the opening wdv Eighteen lakh, twenty-five lakhs, and four lakhs. That's five lakhs. Eighteen lakh, twenty-five lakh, and five lakh is the opening WDV. Okay, sir. Then we have additions during the year. Okay, eighteen twenty-five five. We'll have additions during the year. Okay. I'm adding the purchases. Purchases are fifty-seven lakhs, four lakhs, seventeen lakhs. These are the purchases during the year. That's the subtotal. Okay. Seventy-five lakhs. Okay, so I'm going to reduce the sales. What are the sales? Sales are block A eight thousand only. Block two. Twenty-eight lakh seventy thousand, huge amount. Block three, forty-two lakh. Wow. Block three, forty-two lakh. Okay. So if we reduce these two amounts, seventy-five lakh minus eight thousand, this gives me a figure of seventy-four lakh ninety-two thousand. Okay. Twenty-nine lakhs minus twenty-eight lakh seventy thousand. This gives me a balance of thirty thousand. This gives me a gives me a balance of nine. So, guys, in the last case, my sales proceed are much higher than the WDV which I have. So, there's no question of depreciation in the last case. Short-term capital gain will arise. Question is not asking about short-term capital gain, so I'm ignoring block three as of now. No depreciation, no additional depreciation eligible for block number three. Now, talking about block number one and two. We'll have additional depreciation as well as the normal depreciation. Both the depreciations will be there. So first we'll calculate the normal depreciation, then we'll calculate the additional depreciation. Okay. So guys, normal depreciation seventy-four lakh ninety-two thousand. That is the total amount of block which is there. Normal depreciation will be calculated at the rate of fifteen percent. So the amount of normal depreciation is. Eleven lakh twenty-three thousand eight hundred. The addition has also been made during the year, where the put-to-use uh, values for full year, okay, more than one eighty days, so full year depreciation is eligible. Yes, sir. Eleven lakh twenty-three thousand eight hundred. Now, what is the additional depreciation which is eligible, guys? Additional depreciation will be eligible on this particular amount, which is fifty-seven lakhs. So, fifty-seven lakhs multiplied by Twenty percent is the amount of additional depreciation. Fifty-seven lakhs multiplied by twenty percent, which is eleven lakh forty thousand, is the additional depreciation in this case. Okay, sir. Let's come on to the second part. Second part, guys. Uh, the 
WDV is 30,000. 30% is the uh, amount of depreciation which is there. So if we talk about normal depreciation, 30,000. Now, obviously, guys, I'll assume that the 30,000, which is remainder value, is from the purchases, right? It's not from the opening balance. Opening balance has been sold. First and first out method is employed. Opening balance is entirely sold. So the remainder value, which is 30,000, is from the additions during the year. Additions during the year have been made post 180 days. So half of the depreciation will be eligible. So 30,000 multiplied by 15%, half of the depreciation, which is 4,500 is the eligible depreciation. 4,500 is the eligible depreciation. Okay, sir. Now, what is the um, uh, uh, additional depreciation? Ideally, the additional depreciation is 4 lakh rupees, right? Multiplied by 10%. Why 10%? Why not 20%? Because it has been put to use for less than 180 days. So, it is um, uh, it is to be uh, considered as uh, half, half, right? 10% is to be considered. Now, when you consider 10%, it comes out to 40,000, okay? It comes out to Ideally, it comes out to 40,000. But we need to consider, guys, we need to consider that is 40,000 is subject to 30,000 minus 4,500. So, the remainder value after the normal depreciation is 30,000 minus 4,500, which is 25,500. So, ideally, the additional depreciation can at max B can at max be 25,500. The additional depreciation cannot be more than this particular amount because then, you know, depreciation cannot be higher than the WDV. So, the depreciation, additional depreciation cannot be higher than this amount. So, it is subject to 30,000. Total depreciation is subject to 30,000, obviously. And obviously, in the third part, there's no depreciation, no additional depreciation. So, the matter ends there. That is how you are going to answer the question on additional depreciation, normal depreciation. Both of them should be answered by you. Okay, sir, got it. Now coming on to B part. B part says, Mr. R and Mrs. R holds 20% and 30% equity shares in A Limited, which means substantial holder. Both of them are substantial holders in A Limited. They are employed in A Limited. Taxable salary being 2 lakh 40,000, 3 lakh 60,000 without any technical or professional qualification. Other income of R and Mrs. R are 70,000, 1 lakh respectively. Find out net income of R and Mr. Mrs. R for 2022 23. Guys, ditto question from your study mat. Ditto question. And I forgot to mention the salary question which we had done earlier. That was also ditto from your study mat. So, yes, um, things are very clear that you know uh, you'll find questions as it is from your study mat. When the questions are coming as it is from your study mat, you definitely have to be very cautious that you do your study mat in a full fledged manner. All right, the question is very simple. Whose income is higher? The income is clubbed in the hands of the income whose other income is higher. Other income is higher 1 lakh rupees of Mrs. R. Okay. So, Mrs. R, Mrs. R has her own income which is 3 lakh 60,000. She will have to pay taxes on the income of Mr. R as well. Mr. R's income is 2 lakh 40,000 is the income of Mr. R. So, Mrs. R will have to pay taxes on Mr. R's income as well, 2 lakh 40,000. Plus 1 lakh rupees is the other income of Mrs. R. So, the total income of Mrs. R is 7 lakh rupees. 7 lakh rupees is the total income of Mrs. R. This is Mrs. R. Right? Now, talking about Mr. R. Talking about Mr. R. Mr. R has income of 70,000 from other sources. His income of 2 lakh 50,000, 40,000 is clubbed with Mrs. R. So, he will not pay taxes on that income. So, taxable income of Mr. R is 7,000 rupees. What is the question? Question is find out the net income of Mr. R and Mrs. R. These are the net income of Mr. R, Mrs. R. Of course, guys, little bit of presentation is definitely required. All right. Okay, there are certain short notes and definitions which are to be written in question number eight. And I'll dictate these uh, also to you so that you are able to understand to what extent you have to write. Okay, to what extent you have to write. So I'll di dictate these answers to you. So the very first definition that you need to um, write is pre-construction period. What do you mean by pre-construction period? Please uh, start um, uh, writing. Pre-construction period is the period commencing from the date of borrowing of loan. And it ends on the earlier of the following. Number one, date of repayment of loan. Or number two, 31st March, immediately prior to the date of completion of construction or acquisition of property. 
this is the ideal length of the answer which is expected out of you in a three marks question okay so yes you can also uh, mention that if your um, uh, construction starts earlier than your borrowing of uh, loan or your borrowing of loan is before the construction starting uh, period then guys the construction the pre construction period will start from the later of both of them so that is also what you can mention all right question number 2 second part is bonus stripping you need to write something about bonus stripping please write where any person buys shares where any person buy shares within a period of 3 months prior to the record date and he sells such shares within a period of 9 months after record date it is known as bonus stripping it is known as bonus stripping the capital loss arising from such a transaction shall be ignored shall be ignored all right next one is revocable transfer what do you mean by revocable transfer so there are two uh, parameters of defining revocable transfer please write down revocable transfer means that revocable transfer means that the transfer is subject to either of the following two things the transfer is subject to either of the following two things number 1 retransfer of asset back to the transferer retransfer of asset or income back to the transferer and number 2 reassume of power reassume of power over any part over any part or whole of the income or asset by the transferer by the transferer so if these two things are there then that particular transfer is known as a revocable transfer next one is deduction under section 80e deduction in respect of interest and loan deduction in respect of interest and loan interest on loan taken for residential house property is covered under section 80 ee full stop the loan should be up to a maximum of rupees 35 lakhs full stop the residential property should be worth at max rupees 50 lakhs the deduction is allowed up to maximum of rupees 50000 next one belated return what do you mean by belated return section 139 4 of the act please write belated return under section 139 4 of the act may be filed before Three months prior to the end of the relevant assessment year, or before completion of assessment under Section One Forty Four, whichever is earlier, whichever is earlier. Okay, sir, got it. So yes, this was illustration number eight for you. And now finally. section d and guys guys i would also always recommend you to start with section d at the last juncture because it will be lengthy it will be little confusing it will have some points which will make you think a lot so you need some bit of time to attempt this particular part so first complete all the parts and then jump on to this particular part because i don't want you to stuck on some word or some line of this particular Case study and waste your one hour and then realizing that oh I missed on doing question number three question number four question number five so my always my uh, preference would always be that you know pick up section D at the last not during the beginning or uh, uh, middle of the paper all right so 
you are required to answer all the questions in that section in each question followed by a space where you are required to type your answer your answer is required to be typed over here question number 9 Mr. X aged 47 years. So he's a normal person, not a senior citizen at all. Employed by PQR Chemicals Limited, Chennai, provides the following information for previous year 21 22. Basic salary 45,000 per month. Commission at the rate of 5,000 per month. DNS allowance 8,000 per month. Three fourth of part of salary. Computing pension, but only 60% is part of salary. Computing for other retirement benefits. So, guys, we are uh, concerned with other retirement benefits. We are not concerned with what part is given to pension. That is just given to confuse us. Okay. We are only concerned with 60% part, which is there for the retirement benefits. House rent allowance 8,000 per month and Tiffin allowance 6,000 per month, but only with effect from 1st March 2022. So Tiffin allowance is only given <coughs> for one month, which is the month of March. He resides in a rented accommodation in Chennai. This person is staying in a rented accommodation in Chennai. <coughs> rent being rupees 10,000 per month. The rent is 10,000 per month. However, the employer company acquires this property from landlord on January 31st, 2022. So the same property which was, um, which a person was acquiring as rented accommodation in Chennai, um, the employer company had acquired this property for their own. <coughs> and allotted it as rent free unfurnished accommodation to X without charging him any rent. So guys for the first half of the um, uh, of the year you need to uh, calculate your taxable HRA house rent allowance and for the next part of the year you need to calculate the taxable rent free accommodation. That is how you are going to split your income in two parts and you need to consider your taxability accordingly. X contributes 5000 per month towards recognized provident fund. Contribution by employer company is not more than 12 percent so there is no question of disallowance. Okay, All the uh, the entire amount is um, not to be taxed. Okay, there's no question of uh, taxing this uh, employer's contribution because if em employer's contribution is 12%, then it is uh, well within the time limit. So there's no question of taxability of the employer's contribution. Provident fund interest is created at the rate of 9.5%. That is also permissible. Okay, comes to 72,000 for the previous year 21, 22. X pays life insurance premium on the life of his married daughter. Annual insurance premium being 10,000. Some insured 95,000 now. I'm very much okay with the insurance premium, but guys, 10% of this amount should have been the uh, amount which is eligible, right? So we'll allow only 9,500 as the amount which is allowed. Premiums which became due in May 15, 2020 and May 2021 are paid during previous year. So uh, some earlier payments are also made during the previous year. Income of X from other sources, 90,000. X purchase NSC. NSC is purchased for 50,000 during the previous year. Besides, he gets a pension of 5,000 per month from the previous employer with whom X was employed till 2000. So pension is also received from the previous employer from which he is um, actually employed earlier. Now, what is the requirement? State the amount of taxable house rent accommodation, right? Compute the value of rent free accommodation. So HR is required to be computed. Rent free accommodation is required to be computed. Compute the total income of Mr. X for assessment year 2023 and the tax liability of Mr. X for assessment year 2023. Guys, I've already told you, I will compute this and I will get answer to all my above questions. So I'll target computing this and all the above questions will be automatically answered. So let's start our answer. All right, so we need to compute the salary and we need to make considerable amount of working notes as well. Why am I writing so much? No need. Nine. Okay, we need to compute the salary income. I'll start with basic. I'll take all the components over here and add up all of them. Okay. So what's the basic? 45,000 per month. <coughs> 5 lakh 40,000. What is the... Okay, let's write commission first before any allowances. What is the amount of commission? Commission is 5,000 per month, okay? Not as a percentage of salary. So it is 60,000. Then what is the DNS allowance? Eight thousand per month. Ninety-six thousand. Ninety-six thousand is the DNS allowance. Eight thousand per month. All right. 
house rent allowance okay and we need to compute the exemption from house rent allowance as well so what is the house rent allowance which i have received 10000 per month is the rent house rent allowance is 8000 per month okay and for how many months is the house rent allowance being given because from 31st january property was acquired so february march for 2 months house rent allowance is not given so for 10 months house rent allowance is given for 10 months house rent allowance is given so 8000 multiplied by 10 which is 80000 is the house rent allowance we'll come we'll need to compute the exempt house rent allowance okay we need to compute the exempt house rent allowance all right so i'll i'll start with working note number 1 okay exemption amount will be lower or falling hra received which is 80000 okay now whether the city is a metro state or a non metro state it's a metro state 50% of salary i'll have to compute salary separately then 10% of rent paid 10% of salary is rent paid minus 10% of salary rent paid minus 10% of salary that is the third limit okay sir so the actual which is received is 80000 50% of salary is what we need to compute so we need to compute the salary for the purpose of hra okay this will include basic so what is the basic amount the basic amount is what is the basic amount 45000 per month okay for 10 months this is uh, uh, given as an accommodation so the basic is 450000 now what is the dearness allowance 8000 8000 per month is the dearness allowance okay 8000 multiplied by 10 is 80000 multiplied by 60% is what is forming part of the retirement so it is 480000 so uh, sorry 48000 48000 plus 450000 it gives me a figure of 498000 Gives me a figure of four lakh ninety eight thousand. Now, what will be the fifty percent of salary? It is two lakh forty nine thousand. It's two lakh forty nine thousand. Then rent paid minus ten percent of salary. What is the rent paid? Please tell me what is the rent paid. Guys, rent paid is ten thousand per month. Okay. So one lakh rupees is the rent paid for ten months. One lakh rupees minus minus ten percent of salary. Okay. Ten percent of salary is forty nine thousand eight hundred. Forty nine thousand eight hundred. So this is a figure of fifty thousand two hundred. What is the lowest out of all of three? What is the lowest out of all of th all of three? Fifty thousand two hundred is the lowest out of all of three. So what is the exempt amount? Fifty thousand two hundred is the exempt amount. <coughs> this is a figure of twenty nine thousand eight hundred. The taxable HRA is twenty nine thousand eight hundred. That is the taxable HRA. Okay, sir. Next is Tiffin allowance, fully taxable. Fully taxable, just for one month. Okay. Okay. Next is rent-free accommodation. Now we need to compute the rent-free accommodation. And guys, the accommodation is given in a metro state, so fifteen percent of salary. That is the um, uh, amount. Now the question is that what components of salary will be included in this fifty thousand? And please remember. that uh, only for 2 months rent free accommodation is given all right okay so 2 months we'll calculate the rent free accommodation and for that purpose the salary which is calculated is slightly different okay so salary for rent free accommodation first is basic for 2 months which is 90000 okay then it's dearness allowance okay dearness allowance is 8000 per month is the total amount 8000 multiplied by 2 Multiplied by sixty percent, it's ninety six hundred. Then we'll add up all the taxable allowances, all the taxable allowances which are there. We're going to add up all of them. Uh, but yes, please remember one very important point: HRA is not going to be added because HRA was not there in the month in which RFA is given. So please remember, HRA will not be uh, added. <clears throat> you know, uh, out of out of your anxiety, you might add all the allowances and you might HRA also in that allowance. So different allowance will be added. <coughs> Six thousand rupees will be added. Plus, guys, there is some commission as well. Commission will also be added. 
whether it is lump sum or otherwise doesn't matter commission will also be added and it will be added 5000 per month so 10000 will be added as commission so what is the total amount of salary 90000 plus 9600 plus 6000 plus 10000 it's 115600 115600 is the salary so this multiply by 15% gives me a figure of Seventeen thousand three hundred and forty. Rent free accommodation is seventeen thousand three hundred and forty. Then, guys, some pension is also received. Yes, that is also taxable as salary. Family pension is not taxable as salary. Please note that fact. Very, very important. Okay, sir. Pension is sixty thousand. <coughs> This gives me the GTI. Let's calculate the GTI. Let's add up all the parts. Eight zero nine one four zero is the GTI. GTI is eight zero nine one four zero. Now we are going to uh, reduce the reductions. First of all, we are going to reduce the standard reduction, which will be reduced for fifty thousand rupees. Then we are going to reduce the ATC kind of reductions. All those reductions are required to be uh, reduced. But before uh, reducing those reductions, we are going to add if any income from other sources there, which is there in this particular case. Yes, income from other sources is definitely there in this particular case. So. Ideally, guys, this GTI should be written over here. This is gross taxable salary. All right. I first. What is income from other sources? What is income from other sources? Ninety thousand. Okay. Gives me a figure of eight forty nine one four zero. Gives me a figure of eight lakh forty nine thousand one hundred and forty in total. Okay, sir, got it. Now, yes, deductions under Section eighty C are required to be reduced from this particular part. Less eighty C deductions. Okay. So first of all, we'll think about life insurance premium. Okay. Life insurance premium is there. So it says ninety five thousand is the total sum insured, which is there ninety five hundred, and uh, the installments which were due in May fifteen twenty twenty, and May fifteen twenty twenty one they are also paid in the current year. During previous year twenty one twenty two, those installments are also uh, paid. So both the installments are paid. So guys, ninety five hundred multiplied by two, two installments are paid. So ninety five hundred multiply by two. That is the allowance of life insurance premium. So life insurance premium will be ninety five thousand. Why ninety five hundred? Because I have restricted the amount to uh, to ten percent of sum insured. So nineteen thousand is the amount of reduction. Next, recognized provident fund. There is a contribution which is made to the provident fund by the employee. Right. That contribution, of course, is uh, eligible for eighty C deduction. Yes, sir. What is that contribution? Five thousand per month, okay? RPF sixty thousand is the amount of reduction. Next one is national saving certificate. Fifty thousand rupees has been invested. Okay. What's the total amount? One lakh twenty-nine thousand is the total amount. If I reduce it from the GTI, then I'll get a figure of seven two zero one four zero. So the net taxable income is seven two zero one four zero. This is the net taxable income. If I were to calculate the tax liability, <coughs> right? If I were to calculate the tax liability on this particular amount, seven two zero one four zero. Okay. Uh, this plus five lakh rupees multiplied by. Twenty percent plus twenty 
12,500. <coughs> He's a normal resident, guys. Normal resident. So, uh, normal slab rate will be applicable. Multiply by 5, 5 lakh rupees. Multiply by 20% plus 12,500. Gives me a figure of 56528. I'll add says to it. Five eight seven eight nine. Of course, I'm going to round it off to five eight seven nine zero. That is the tax liability which I have created. So yes, guys, uh, a lengthy question, but worth the time which we spend on it because it gives me twelve marks, full twelve marks, and step marking is there. So even if you get certain things correct, like 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 calculation of RFA, calculation of HRA. If you get these things right, then you know you get good marks. Um, uh, stepwise marking there is there. So even if your entire question is wrong, and if you get these things right, then you get step marking. That is the positive part about this particular question. But yes, um, I would generally would not want this question to be picked up earlier. I would want this question to be picked up at a later stage because I don't want to get stuck or spend a lot of time in thinking about these things. I want to quickly finish the uh, easier parts ones. All right, so guys, that was all on our, my discussion for um, uh, your uh, MTP. That's all for this particular discussion. Now I'm going to touch base with you, the discussion which I had to do with you uh, with respect to the strategy which you're going to prepare for the June 2022 examination, the time which is really, really less for June 2022, how to effectively use that time to our fullest extent so that we are going to um, you know get good marks in our examination so guys uh, you know this analysis is a very much my personal analysis and you know you cannot sue me together if uh, tomorrow uh, if you know this analysis doesn't doesn't um, uh, stand tall to its claims you 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 guys don't have right to sue me or something like that but on a lighter note guys uh, this is just an analysis okay this might change please understand the fact that this might change this is just a trend which i have analyzed and i'm putting it forth in front of you doesn't mean that the chapters which i'm telling you to um, uh, you know lay lem less emphasis on you leave that ch chapter entirely doesn't mean that at all please understand this fact it's a professional examination. Any and every chapter can come to the fullest extent. Any and every chapter can be uh, there in the examination um, uh, for more percentages as compared to the last term's examinations. So please do not, um, uh, you know, uh, leave the uh, chapters which I'm saying are less important. Less important doesn't mean you leave the chapter. Less important just means that you um, uh, uh, do not do them in great detail. This is the trend in front of you, okay? 20 study notes you have in your examination. I am marking top 10 or 12 study notes which will cover 70 or 80 percent of your entire syllabus. Yes. First one is the residential status. Then salary, house property, capital gain, PGBP. Okay. These four heads are most important heads. Residential status, then these four heads, most important heads. Clubbing, set off. Clubbing, set off two chapters which are really really important from income from other sources section 56 to 10 gift tax from section income from other sources section 56 to 10 gift tax then talking about deductions tds assessment procedures and return that's it that's it guys these 11, 12 study notes will cover 80% of your syllabus or 70% at least of your syllabus. So if you focus on these chapters, which I have marked, of course, I've left one assessment of various persons, very, very important where different kind of um, entities are there for which taxes to be computed. Yes, um, you know, chapters like TDS and deductions are more remembrance based. So in my book, I have given at the end of the uh, chapter, I've given a summary of these two chapters, do the chapters from those uh, summary notes so that you remember them. TDS and deductions are remembrance, they are not um, much to understand. Similarly, return uh, and assessment procedures are more on remembrance, not much to understand. Guys, these questions, these chapters are really, really key to your examination. Plus, in the last examination, advanced tax has also come for a um, uh, for a good eight marks or something like that. 
so prepare advanced tax as well so yes if you strategize your uh, chapters if you strategize all these chapters in abc analysis which i have done in this particular chart then guys you are going to save your time smartly you are going to um, actually do your paper and uh, by uh, attempting these important study notes you will be covering 70 to 80% of your entire syllabus so yes that was my strategy for preparation of direct taxes for your june 2022 examination that's all for this particular session yes a little long session but a very worthful one because you will be able to understand the mtp and the strategy well please study hard and yes i'll do one more thing i'll be um, uh, giving you certain important uh, sections which are out of these important chapters i will be giving you certain sections which are more important than other sections in particular chapters that also i'll give you i'll be giving you the list on the whatsapp group which is available for all the direct tax students the whatsapp group is available on 9643929913 please be part of that whatsapp group and over there i'll be sharing some more tips some more important um, uh, chapter wise sections or some more questions uh, i'll be sharing my thoughts over there and all these things will be relevant for june 2022 examination yes we are determined to conquer june 2022 examination to the fullest extent time is less but our strategy will be strong and we are going to sail through the june 2022 examination on that positive note all the very best and happy studying